For me, the hour has come for a new generation to lead the Democratic caucus that I so deeply respect. The emotional end of an era on Capitol Hill as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the first and only woman to rise to that position, announces she will step aside as leader of the Democratic caucus in Congress as Republicans take back control of the House and set out their agenda. The war in Ukraine. We're on the ground as Russia continues to unleash devastating missile strikes. Millions are now without power as three men are convicted in absentia and believed to be in Russia for nearly 300 murders, eight years after a Malaysian jetliner was shot down over Ukraine. The life-threatening snow emergency. The alerts tonight from Wisconsin to New York. More than a foot of snow already falling in some areas. Buffalo bracing for up to six feet as temperatures plunge from coast to coast. The ongoing threat, new details about the murder of four University of Idaho students at their off-campus home, what authorities are now saying about the search for a suspect and why some are leaving town. Driver charged after plowing into law enforcement recruits during a training run in Southern California, injuring more than a dozen as authorities now investigate what happened. The COVID long haulers, life may be back to normal for some, but others are still experiencing symptoms long after their COVID infection, from breathing issues to brain fog. It feels like my brain is on fire, like it's being cooked on the daily. And last year, it was so intense that it was starting to cause me to have extremely violent involuntary body movements. This is enough being done to address this disability. And Limitless, I sit down with actor Chris Hemsworth, a big screen superhero now pushing the boundaries of his own mind and body from ice baths and fasting to daredevil heights, what he and his family said about his new quest for longevity. I think what it gave me by the end of it was an even greater appreciation for what I have right in front of me in life. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are tracking a major snowstorm in the Great Lakes region, as much as five feet of snow in the forecast. Ginger Z has more on that in a moment. But we begin tonight with the end of an era in Congress for a trailblazer. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, the first woman to ever hold that position, announced today that she is leaving Democratic leadership after more than two decades. The 82-year-old said the hour has come for a new generation to lead. Pelosi is also the first woman to be second in line to the president. She will remain in Congress to represent her district, as she has for 35 years. President Biden called her the most consequential speaker of the House in U.S. history. Tonight, even some of her longtime adversaries from across the aisle are acknowledging her accomplishments. And now the question of who will replace her. Our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, leads us off tonight from Washington. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Today on Capitol Hill, Congress coming to a standstill to witness a historic passing of the torch. The House will be in order. Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing that come January, she will no longer lead House Democrats, something she's done for 20 years. For me, the hours come for a new generation to lead the Democratic caucus that I so deeply respect. Pelosi is a singular figure in American history. When I came to the Congress in 1987, there were 12 Democratic women. Now they're over 90, and we want more. <laughs> the first and only From female California, speaker of the House. Nancy Pelosi. Her father, a congressman himself, politics in her blood. So help me God. Her first came motherhood, raising five children before she switched careers. Never would I have thought that someday I would go from homemaker to house speaker. As speaker, Pelosi worked with four presidents, often going toe to toe with Donald Trump. The power of the speaker is awesome. Awesome. President Biden today calling her the most consequential speaker of the House in our history. Because of Nancy Pelosi, the lives of millions and millions of Americans are better, even in districts represented by Republicans who voted against her bills and too often vilify her. <laughs> Pelosi's colleagues cheering as she listed her accomplishments. Transformative health care reform with President Barack Obama. <laughs> even Newt Gingrich in the past year saying, you could argue she's been the strongest speaker in history. Pelosi's announcement comes nearly three weeks after her husband Paul was viciously attacked in their San Francisco home. For my dear husband Paul, who has been my beloved partner in life and my pillar of support, thank you. We're all grateful for all the prayers and well wishes as he continues 
his recovery. Thank you so much. Pelosi says she will remain in Congress, just not in leadership. In January, Republicans take power, but only with a slim majority. Last week, the American people spoke, and their voices were raised in defense of liberty, of the rule of law, and of democracy itself. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, so who's in position to succeed Pelosi as leader of the House Democrats? Well, Lindsay, I'll tell you that the front runner is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of New York. If elected by House Democrats, he would make history as the first black lawmaker to lead a party in Congress. But listen, Pelosi will still have major influence. She's stepping down from leadership, but she will continue to serve out her term in Congress. But she did make one thing very clear today. She believes it's time for a new generation of leaders to step in. Lindsay. Changing of the guard here for sure. Rachel Scott from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. Next to the massive snow totals in the forecast for the Buffalo area, five feet of snow in some areas and winter has not even officially begun. Our Matt Rivers is in the suburbs of that city where the heaviest lake effect snow is being predicted. Tonight, drivers facing whiteout conditions. An Arctic blast fueling what the National Weather Service is calling a crippling, life-threatening storm. There will not be a time from 7 p.m. tonight until 7 p.m. tomorrow where it is safe to drive. Wrecked vehicles already lining highways north of Syracuse in Parrish, New York. Continuous snowfall rates of up to four inches an hour expected in some spots. In Buffalo, they're bracing for a potentially paralyzing accumulation. You're telling me this storm is different than other ones you've seen. Yeah, there's potential for 48 inches of snow here, and that is nowhere near a normal snow for Buffalo, New York. So. This will be unique even to the city of Buffalo. West of Buffalo, dozens of truckers hunkering down Wednesday night, packing this rest area off Interstate 90 to ride out the storm there. New York's governor closing more than 130 miles of the thruway from Rochester to the Pennsylvania border to commercial traffic, including big rigs, starting this afternoon. When they jackknife, as we saw in previous storms, they literally can paralyze our highways, putting people at risk, stranding motorists, for hours, if not days. That's what happened almost exactly eight years ago. In November of 2014, a lake effect system dumped more than five feet of snow on western New York. At least 13 people died. Tonight, they are bracing for yet another potentially historic storm, one that will test this region that knows about powerful storms. Really putting them to the test. We see the snow already coming down. Matt Rivers joins us now from Angola, New York. Tonight, Matt, you reported much of the throughway is closed to trucks. Bottom line here, it sounds like drivers just should not get on the roads unless it's an emergency. Lindsay, that is the advice we're getting from officials who tell us they are very concerned about drivers being stranded and then buried in all of this snow. We're told the National Guard is standing by and that snowmobiles and other rescue vehicles have been staged in advance to try and be ready to get out and rescue people quickly. Lindsay. Seems like they are getting all the preparations underway. Matt, our thanks to you. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins us now. And Ginger, it appears that old man winter is early with the coldest air of the season already for many of us. And forecasted totals from this lake effect snowstorm just massive. We're talking about as many as five feet yes. of snow. It's really astounding to see numbers like this, and we don't get this every single season with lake effect. While they can be very prolific, uh, think 22 years ago when Buffalo itself had 24.9 inches of snow in just 24 hours. That's their record 24-hour snowfall. That often comes in a days-long event, and that's what this type of storm is going to do or this type of event. So let's dive into the maps and see that Ironwood, Michigan, and the Upper Peninsula, parts of Wisconsin, down to my hometown of Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo, up into Traverse City area. Then those lake affects snow warnings for Ohio, Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, Buffalo, of course, over to Watertown. So here's what happens. The totals end up looking like this. More than a foot along 131, say. That's really messy in West Michigan. Then you go over to just south of Buffalo, and that's where the heftiest totals bullseye. Watertown, two to four feet around there. Nothing to sneeze at. But how does this happen? It's when you get three to four inch per hour snowfall rates. 
thunder snow will not be out of the question. You're going to have super convection, like a thunderstorm type that would drop that much precipitation. And that's why we have these extreme impacts anticipated surrounding those two cities along Interstate 90 and I-81. Don't forget that power outages could be a problem. And of course, you could end up with extremely dangerous travel. I always try to emphasize it's not just the snow on the road, but the visibility can be totally fine and then go to absolute zero because these bands are so narrow. The wind chills across the nation don't give in for really anybody except for extreme South Florida from Louisiana over to Georgia we have freeze alerts and so I think this time of year Lindsay it is really hard for me to imagine that one week ago today right. I was standing in a rare late season landfalling hurricane and here we go with what could be a record maker and I've had a little experience with thunder snow it is as dangerous as it is scary so uh, I'm sure yes. the people are going to be staying off the roads if possible ginger our thanks to you Growing fear in an Idaho college town tonight where four students were murdered. New details are now emerging about the two other roommates who were also inside the house at the time of the killings but survived. And in what investigators are now asking local businesses. ABC's Kena Whitworth is in Idaho. Tonight, police in Idaho pouring over the crime scene inside that off-campus home where four college students were brutally murdered. Investigators say the two surviving roommates have been very cooperative with police. Potentially they are witnesses. Potentially they are victims. Um, you know, we want Potentially to they're the key potentially to this they're whole the key. thing. Exactly. Potentially they're the key to this whole thing. Tonight, some shops are closing early. There's frustration with police and fear in the community. Did you hear anything that night? Anything out of the no. ordinary? I'm like 50 yards away. Yeah. It was like, that's scary for me. Police walking back earlier claims that there's no threat to the public. We still believe it's a targeted attack. But the reality is there's still a person out there who committed four horrible, horrible crimes. So I think we got to go back to there is a threat out there still, possibly. Investigators piecing together a timeline with videos from that night. Two of the victims seen here at a food truck on their way home from a bar. The other two had returned from a party. Police found no signs of forced entry, but Kaylee Gonzalez's sister telling us that people were in and out of the house all the time. When I'm looking at this door, there's like a, it's like a keypad with numbers on it. Mm -hmm. But that's how they got in and out. Um, so there is that door. There's also a backsliding door. Um, and I, I will say, yes, there is that keypad lock on it. And my sister was absolutely a, a door locker. This was the party house and it's been generations. And so I won't say that uh, they were very private with that code. So potentially a number of people had access to the house. Kena Whitworth joins us now. Kena, uh, there are a lot of questions about just who called 911 and when. Right, so Lindsay, investigators won't say why it took nearly eight hours for that 911 call to be made, what happened in that time frame. What investigators are saying is that right now they are going to local businesses and they're asking if anyone recently purchased a fixed blade knife. This is just moments ago, Lindsay, the coroner confirming that all four students were stabbed to death. And Lindsay, at this point, we still have no suspect and no murder weapon. So scary. Kana Whitworth, our thanks to you. The man who police say drove the wrong way and then plowed into dozens of law enforcement recruits in California has been booked on suspicion of attempted murder. 25 recruits were injured, two remain in critical condition. The driver is being held without bail. Our Will Carr has the latest. Tonight, that wrong way driver who slammed into a group of 75 law enforcement recruits on their morning run is under arrest. What can you tell us about the driver at this point? So the driver at this point uh, is 22 years old. Nicholas Gutierrez booked on suspicion of attempted murder on a peace officer. The sheriff initially saying the crash appeared to be an accident. The cause of the accident, motive, anything is unknown at this time. Authorities now investigating what led this SUV to strike the group at an estimated 30 miles an hour, critically injuring five runners. There were no skid marks on the road, and the recruits had been running with escort vehicles and wearing reflective vests. The surveillance video capturing the terrifying moments just before impact. Smoke filling the air moments after Gutierrez allegedly plowed into the crowd. Authorities say the 22-year-old passed a field sobriety test. He was detained by recruits and later booked. Tonight, the sheriff's department's being tight-lipped about why they booked the driver on attempted murder. He's being held without bail, and his case will now be turned over to the DA's office. Lindsay.
Will, thank you. Now to Ukraine, where President Zelensky says 10 million people are without power tonight as Russia continues its assault. It's yet another stark reminder of just how long Russia has been waging war on its neighbor. ABC's James Longman is in Dnipro. Tonight, eight years after a Malaysian jetliner was shot down over Ukraine, three men were today convicted for the murders of the 298 people on board. Verdachte Girkin, Dubinsky and Chachenko worden veroordeeld. A Dutch court sentenced two Russians and a pro-Kremlin Ukrainian to life sentences for their role in the downing of flight MH17, which was hit by a Russian missile while it was flying over rebel-held territory shortly after Putin invaded Crimea in 2014. The men were convicted in absentia and are still protected by Moscow, so will likely never serve their sentence. Nearly a decade after that horror, Russia continues to act with impunity launching a new wave of missile attacks today. This strike caught on camera in the eastern Ukrainian city of Dnipro. Nearly every single window blown out, but people yet again already trying to piece their lives back together. You can see some of the damage uh, up here as well. Ukrainian air defense is active across the country, trying to shoot down those Russian missiles. The US and NATO believe one of those Ukrainian missiles crashed inside Poland this week, killing two people. President Zelensky insists it was not one of Ukraine's. Their officials were today granted access to the site to join the investigation. <laughs> Moscow aiming to cripple the power grid and make life unlivable for civilians as winter sets in while they retreat on the battlefield. In newly liberated Kherson, the airfield is littered with destroyed Russian vehicles. This is a great visualization of the sheer scale of Russian losses here. The Russians left Kherson because Ukraine forced them to. Local commander Konstantin shows us round. Let's step back. This is the Russian bunker. And what he's doing there is making sure there are no mines. Russians leave mines absolutely everywhere. He's prodding the earth, very shallow, to make sure there's no device. But then Konstantin raises a finger after hearing the distant thud of Russian artillery. Come on. We took cover protectively. Go on. We've got to get out, I think. Civilians across this country have almost no warning when Russia strikes. Such prolonged fear there are. Thanks to James for that. When we come back, dramatic video captures the moment a house explodes what might have caused this fiery scene. And Chris Hemsworth goes beyond his limit. The Thor actor tells us about his latest challenge, a National Geographic TV series, how he says his new show, Limitless, tested him both in his body and mind. But first, brain, fro brain fog, respiratory issues, and constant pain. While COVID symptoms end for many, others struggle with them for years, and there is little help on the horizon. Phil Lipoff brings us the stories of people still struggling with the life-altering effects of long COVID. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. 
Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Shocking moments caught on a home security camera in Indiana. It captured the moment a home across the street, you see it there, just exploded. The blast destroyed the home and sent debris flying around the neighborhood. Four people were actually inside at the time. Fortunately, all of them got out on their own and two were taken to the hospital. The cause of the explosion remains under investigation, but officials believe it's related to natural gas. It has been more than two and a half years since the first reported COVID cases in the United States. For some who have contracted COVID, the illness came and went. But according to the CDC, a range of symptoms still linger in nearly one in five American adults. For two women that we spoke with, one in Boston, the other in Florida, those symptoms are debilitating, painful, and life-altering. Our Phil Lipoff brings us their stories. <laughs> Cheetah, Cheetah's rough. Yeah. We're having so much fun with TT Nisha on her birthday. It's communicated. So it's a date I like to go back to. When I'm in denial, that maybe I am a hypochondriac. Hey, 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 this is my peace offering to you all. <laughs> maybe I'm being a drama queen. But then I go back to a picture I have on my phone. And when I see that person in the video, I realize I have never been that person since that week. Well, my doctor was the one who I called actually first. She said, well, Given your age and health, it should be no big deal. Just take some Tylenol and do some yoga. You're running, you're cycling, you're fit, and you're also 30. Across the country, hospitals are gearing up for influxes of patients. Surge tents popping up around Boston, San Jose, and Salt Lake City. When COVID hit, Nisha was perfectly healthy. She was living her dream, graduating from Boston's MIT in 2014 had her own nonprofit and was saving for a house with her partner. But after getting COVID in March of 2020, she was forced to put all of that on hold. Everyone who met me said, just give it a couple more weeks. The more they saw me slowly going downhill, everyone kind of switched to, you're developing some type of chronic condition. We don't know what it is. I'm terrified. I've, I've been terrified for the past year. I've been especially terrified the last six months. Month after month, her COVID symptoms persisted. And then Nisha started developing new conditions. It feels like my brain is on fire, like it's being cooked on the daily. And last year, it was so intense 
that it was starting to cause me to have extremely violent involuntary body movements. The seizure disorder was getting to the point that I could count the number of hours I could be conscious and functional on one hand. Struggling to find treatment, appointments were limited and doctors were skeptical. But then cases like hers began being reported across the United States and the world. And I had one specialist who at first was like, no, like it's probably nothing, it'll improve in a couple of months, have to come to me and go, my nurse, my right hand woman, she had COVID a couple months ago and everything I've seen with you, she's going through. Tonight, the number of cases of coronavirus spiking here in the U.S. Chinese officials are warning the virus could be even more contagious than first thought. I know people want to hear it's only going to be a matter of weeks and then everything's going to be fine. According to the CDC, one in 13 adults in the United States have had long-lasting COVID symptoms. The so-called long haulers have cleared the initial infection, but are left with symptoms that can last weeks, months, or even years. The symptoms of long COVID can affect different parts of the body, like the lungs, the heart, or the brain, according to the National Institutes of Health. The most common symptoms are fatigue, fever, respiratory problems, heart palpitations, digestive issues, and post-exertional malaise, meaning that symptoms get worse after physical or mental effort. Some of the difficulties we have right now is, as physicians, we don't have good tests. We don't have good biomarkers. So it's been two and a half plus years. We still don't have something where we can definitively diagnose it. Most people also report neurological problems, brain fog, headache, dizziness, pin and needle feelings, and sleep top the list. In many cases, the symptoms can be persistent and extremely debilitating. Even for physicians, long COVID is still not well understood. In some cases, patients have been left bed bound. There's a large number of people who are applying for disability right now. It's probably the number one diagnosis for people applying for social security and disability. I have to sit down and take a break. Walking back to my car. Life pre-COVID, I was a healthy, you know, 30 year old, I was finally obtaining, you know, my dream of becoming a firefighter paramedic. I worked years to do that. I coached soccer and cross country, basketball. Going from being somebody who's incredibly active, somebody who's incredibly fit, to being somebody who's stuck in their bed the majority of the time, struggling to find treatment and doctors who understand what we're dealing with in the masses is very frustrating. As a first responder, Karen became infected with COVID during the initial wave in 2020. Her COVID case was not as severe, but what came after was unexpected. I suffer from over 85 different symptoms, but it's a collection and overlapping of all of these medical conditions that I've developed as a result of having COVID-19. Just like Nisha, Karen's symptoms were so debilitating she was forced to stop working altogether. It is like running a marathon for the simplest of tasks. She can't coach or play soccer. A single mom, she tried applying for Social Security disability benefits, first in April of 2021, a process that took months only to get denied not once but twice. There's not a lot of resources for us right now. What does it look like for single parents like myself, who are the only breadwinners in the family, who are now unable to work, but are not qualifying for social security disability? To this day, and even as a first responder, Karen has received no financial assistance from the Social Security Administration. She decided to create a group to connect with other long haulers and quickly learned there were thousands of people having similar experiences all across the United States. The COVID-19 long hauler advocacy group alone has gathered more than 13,000 patients, many of them struggling to find treatment and access to disability benefits. So we're bringing agencies together to make sure Americans with long COVID who have a disability have access to the rights and resources that are due under the disability law. Even when President Biden announced more than a year ago that long COVID would be considered a disability, and the CDC recently announcing that four in five people with long COVID have trouble performing everyday activities, things haven't changed for people like Karen. Experts say cases like hers are the norm. People with long COVID are having a very difficult time accessing disability, even with the presidential memorandums. Emily Taylor, who has done research on disability for years, says in applying for disability benefits, the process is long and the paperwork substantial. 
Generally speaking, it can take up to two years. It's a long, extenuated process, especially with complex chronic illnesses like long COVID, where medical documentation is really difficult to achieve. Generally, it's about an 80% denial rate in the first round, and that was before the pandemic. So I expect that we're only going to see those numbers get worse as time goes on. In a statement, the Social Security Administration tells ABC News that disability evaluations are based on the limitations that affect an individual's ability to work, not a diagnosis. They also say that to date, they have flagged 40,000 disability claims that include indication of a COVID infection, representing 1% of the disability applications they have received lately, and that they don't have more data on these cases to share. But experts like Emily are seeing a pattern. And I think that's what's been happening with the people with long COVID is that they've been pushed out of a lot of the care systems and um, support networks that are meant to help people just like them. Lack of uh, belief, lack of ability to document their illness, lack of medical care providers that are specializing in that illness or even understand what they're looking at. Long COVID is absolutely a mass disabling event. If we were looking at a potential impact of 8 million people becoming chronically disabled, that is a mass exodus from the workforce and a mass disabling event. Event. Just to assess your exercise tolerance. Almost three years now into the pandemic and without consensus regarding treatment, some hospitals have started opening up clinics to try and rehabilitate patients with long COVID. Some patients may have more predominant neurologic symptoms. Some patients have more cardiovascular symptoms. So there's not a cookie cutter way to provide care for this patient. We don't have clarity of, you know, if the patients will get better. We certainly have seen patients get better, but we also have seen other patients that are still struggling two years after their initial infection. Is that you try to keep Stay up the with the feet. Yeah. The National Institutes of Health is spearheading a $1.2 billion initiative to research and find treatment for long COVID. Yeah. 170, okay. Yeah. But the influx of patients is growing by the day, and the lack of treatment and resources is affecting American families. There are three bills sitting in Congress right now that would grant more funding for research and build more specialized clinics. A conservative estimate is 9 million people in America with long COVID. They want to get back to work. They want to be themselves. This is not in their heads. This is not something that it's just to get out of work or a disability scam. These patients just want to be themselves again. It makes sense. You guys got it? Okay. Without resources or treatment in sight, after years of fighting, Nisha had no choice but to push herself to go back to work. Okay, forgive me. <laughs> because just like so many others living with long COVID, all she wants is to be who she was before she got sick. And I just want to go somewhere that my family can breathe for the first time two plus years. Because right now, they've not been able to not stress about me. I just want them to be able to experience what was my career beforehand, and them watching me twirl and teach and making science and engineering fun. And I want that moment back. Nine million people still suffering. Our thanks to Phil for bringing us that. Still ahead here on Prime, the search for answers in the mysterious death of an American woman who died while on vacation in Mexico with her friends. New details about the facility where Brittany Griner is serving her nine-year sentence in Russia. As Nancy Pelosi's leadership role nears its end, we take a look back at her long and successful political career by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. The NFL highlights that the radar looks suspiciously like the Buffalo Bill logo. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like Your health, your money. Breaking news exclusives pop culture and with the biggest stars music trends style and some laughs and some good food you got me feeling like you know that sounds pretty good gma3 what you need to know a third hour of gma in the afternoon so join us afternoons for everything you need to know with so much at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust 
and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Kanye West is complicated. I think one of the things that we want to do is have an uncomfortable conversation. When you hear the name Ye or Kanye West, how do you guys react? I've only been Jewish for going on maybe 10 years. The amount of anti-Semitism I've experienced has been beyond. This is Impact by Nightline. Is Ye an anti-Semite? Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. She is a political powerhouse, a pioneer known for keeping the Democratic caucus in line and cutting deals with Republicans. Today, she announced she will step down from congressional leadership after a historic tenure. Here is Nancy Pelosi by the numbers. Nancy Patricia D'Alessandro was born in 1940 into a Baltimore political family, the youngest of seven children and the only daughter. She was just six years old when she first saw the Capitol as her father, Thomas D'Alessandro Jr., was sworn in as a member of Congress. He also served as mayor of Baltimore. It wasn't until 1987, at the age of 47, that Pelosi first won her seat representing San Francisco in Congress after earning her reputation as a powerful fundraiser and organizer for California Democrats in the 70s and 80s. In 2001, she became the House Minority Whip and a year later, the House Minority Leader, the first woman to hold either position. And in 2007, another first. She rose to House Speaker, the first woman to be second in line to the presidency. In her speech, she said, we have broken the marble ceiling. After returning to the minority for eight years after Republicans retook control of the House, she was elected Speaker for a second time after Democrats won back control in 2018. A thorn in former President Trump's side in 2020. You'll remember that she famously tore up the official copy of his speech after his State of the Union address and helped lead both impeachment efforts against him. Now 82 years old, her decision to step down as Speaker follows an attack last month of her husband Paul at their San Francisco home. During her announcement today, she paid tribute to her husband as well as their five children and nine grandchildren. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Her disappearance made headlines last year. Now a judge has ordered someone to pay millions in the death of Gabby Petito. And it's a topic rarely talked about, the symptoms and impact of postpartum anxiety. Thanksgiving is just a week away, and there are more holidays, of course, to follow. Tips for how to survive the travel chaos and save some money. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs, and some good food. You got me feeling like you know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So, join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. Kanye West is complicated. 
I think one of the things that we want to do is have an uncomfortable conversation. When you hear the name Ye or Kanye West, how do you guys react? I've only been Jewish for going on maybe 10 years. The amount of anti-Semitism I've experienced has been beyond. This is Impact by Nightline. Is Ye an anti-Semite? Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The House will be in order. Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing that come January, she will no longer lead House Democrats, something she's done for 20 years. For me, the hours come for a new generation to lead the Democratic caucus that I so deeply respect. Pelosi's announcement comes nearly three weeks after her husband Paul was viciously attacked in their San Francisco home. For my dear husband Paul, who has been my beloved partner in life and my pillar of support, thank you. We're all grateful for all the prayers and well wishes as he continues his recovery. Thank you so much. Pelosi says she will remain in Congress, just not in leadership. In January, Republicans take power, but only with a slim majority. Last week, the American people spoke, and their voices were raised in defense of liberty, of the rule of law, and of democracy itself. Drone video capturing numerous tractor trailers that pulled off Interstate I-90 to wait out the conditions crammed into this rest area parking lot. Now, Buffalo bracing for an historic storm. Officials calling it a, quote, crippling, life-threatening system that will impact the region for days. But the worst is yet to come. The forecast calling for potential record snowfall measured not in inches, but in feet. These are the type of storms that really put people's lives at risk. New York's governor declaring a state of emergency, closing part of Interstate Highway 90 to commercial traffic starting later today. Hundreds of thousands lie right in the storm's path. This is considered an extreme event, an extreme weather event. That means it's dangerous. It also means it's life-threatening. Questions remain as a Charlotte, North Carolina woman was found dead in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico late last month. Shanquella Robinson went to Cabo with six friends on October 28th. A day later, on October 29th, she died. Her friends told her parents that she died from alcohol poisoning, but the death certificate states that Robinson died from a severe spinal cord injury and atlas luxation. An investigation for femicide has been initiated by the Baja California Sur Attorney General's Office. A circuit court judge of Sarasota County in Florida has awarded Gabby Petito's family a total of $3 million in a wrongful death lawsuit that they filed against Brian Laundrie's estate back in May. Judge Hunter Carroll ordered Laundrie's parents to pay the amount in a judgment filed today. Petito's family filed their original complaint against Laundrie's estate back on May 6th, asking for over $30,000 in damages that they incurred for funeral and burial expenses. The complaint also claimed that Petito's family, quote, suffered a loss of care and comfort and suffered a loss of probably future companionship, society, and comfort. A lawyer for the Laundry family said that the settlement hopefully brings some closure for the Petito family. American basketball star Brittany Griner has been taken to a Russian penal colony in the region of Mordovia, according to her attorneys. 
Her lawyer saw Griner earlier this week and said that Griner is doing as well as expected and is trying to stay strong as she adapts to the new environment. Griner was sentenced to nine years in prison back in August for drug possession. She was arrested earlier this year at the Moscow airport for having vape cartridges that contained hashish oil. Starbucks workers at more than 100 stores across the country are walking off the job over pay and staffing levels. I see how hard my baristas work and they're getting paid like 15. There's no way. They, the amount of stress, especially with these staffing levels, does not... Like, it's not something that's survivable. This is the largest labor action since workers at the company tried to unionize late last year. Starbucks had previously launched aggressive anti-union efforts, saying that the company works better when it deals directly with employees. Welcome back. Chances are you've heard about postpartum depression, but postpartum anxiety also affects many new parents. It can have a big impact on families who are trying to bond with their new child. So what are the signs of postpartum anxiety and are there treatments to help? ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has this story. As a new mom, Brianna Briscoe says she assumed it was normal to constantly worry about her daughter Frankie. I held her almost 24-7. Like she was my existence. More than a year after she was born, Brianna couldn't let Frankie out of her sight. Physically, it was taking a toll on me. I would not sleep at night. I would just stare at her through the camera in her room. Her anxiety becoming so severe, she was hospitalized. I never could have imagined that throwing up and shaking and like nonstop thoughts racing in your head. And I never thought that that could be from anxiety ever. It's very common to have impairing anxiety symptoms in the postpartum. In the United States, it's probably about somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. So that's a big part of the population. Dr. Right? Lauren Osborne Definitely. says there are several types of postpartum anxiety disorders, including generalized anxiety disorder or GAD. She says one telltale sign of GAD is excessive worrying. Other symptoms can include nausea, muscle tension, or difficulty sleeping. If the symptoms that you're having impair your ability to function, meaning your ability to take care of yourself, your ability to take care of the baby, your ability to have relationships with other people or perform your work, that's when it's impairing, that's when it becomes uh, on the level of a disorder. For some new parents, generalized anxiety disorder might not surface for weeks or even months until after their baby is born. Treatments can include behavioral therapy or antidepressants. People have a lot of concern about not wanting to take medications, um, but it just, it simply isn't true that you can't take medications and breastfeed. Brianna says medication helped her breathe a sigh of relief. Within two days, I felt normal. Well, my normal. I could think again, and I wanted to go out and do things, and it was just like a completely different person. Our thanks to Elizabeth Schulze for that. We are, of course, just one week away from Thanksgiving, and that means the holiday travel season right around the corner, or really upon us at this point. For the best tips to survive the chaos, we are joined in studio by our friend Clint Henderson, managing editor of news at The Point Sky. So good to have you back again. Thanks for having me. So I think the last time you were here, we were talking about just the calamity, really, that mm -hmm. was flying on an airplane over the summer with staffing and just a whole bunch of shortages and, and problems with delays. Are things looking any better for the holiday season travel? You know, good news, they are actually looking better. Um, things have stabilized somewhat. We haven't seen those giant meltdowns that we saw at the peak of summer. Now, partly that's because the number of flights have been reduced mm. and there's less demand right now. So it's going to be a really good test for Thanksgiving to see if the airlines have their acts together. And what is the demand? I mean, considering inflation and the prices just seem so high, are, are people still eager to get out and go to see grandma? It's extraordinary. People are going to travel. They don't care. Like we're, we're expecting close to 2019 levels, really? if not surpassing that. And people have been cooped up. A lot of times they haven't seen their families in a couple of years because mm -hmm. of COVID. They're gonna pay any price to mm -hmm. go home this Christmas. So that's sort of what we're seeing right now. So for those procrastinators out there, Thanksgiving is one week from today. Is it too late? Is there any hope? 
It's never too late, especially very, very last minute. Sometimes the airlines will open up inventory mm. the last second, especially if you've got a stockpile of miles or points you can use. Uh, you're going to get maximum value for them right now because prices are so high. And, you know, you could get lucky, set a Google flight alert. You never know. Um, I'm continuing to monitor for a flight home for to California for Thanksgiving. Um, right now, I'm not seeing much reason for hope, but- Because the prices are just so high yeah. that you may not be able to make it right yeah, now. Yeah, and it's just not worth it uh, to spend you know 50% more than I normally would have to. Looking ahead to, to Christmas, Hanukkah, do you think that it's the same, that, that people are gonna have to maybe wait until the next year in order to actually get some decent deals? Yeah, what I may do in my family is wait and we'll have a, a family celebration in January, but I think you have a little more time before Christmas. Set those Google flight alerts right now. If you've got miles or points, start exploring whether you can use them for Christmas. You do have a little more wiggle room, so we could see some deals before Christmas. So it's not too late for Christmas and Hanukkah maybe. Thanksgiving's a little tougher. Any hot tips, deals that you know of right now? Yeah, we're seeing incredible deals to Europe. So if you okay. can pivot and go overseas for Thanksgiving, there's no demand, there's no crowds, prices are super cheap, and the US dollar is super strong. So that means things are much cheaper for Americans, whether it's Mexico or Paris or London, no matter where you go almost, you're gonna find a deal. Give me a ballpark right now to Paris, to London. $500 for a flight. You're gonna okay. find hotels as low as $200 a night. So if, if you've been putting off a trip to Europe, now is really the time. All right, Clint, we hope you're able to make it out to California <laughs> at some crossed. point, perhaps January, 2023. <laughs> That's right. Clint Anderson from The Points Guy, thanks so much as always. Thank you. He's known for depicting superhero strength on the big screen. Now on the small screen, Chris Hemsworth is pushing the limits of his mental, emotional, and physical capacity in National Geographic's new show, Limitless. The actor is trying to apply new findings from medical science about just how to extend our longevity. I met up with Thor himself to talk about what he calls a life-changing experience on his quest to find a way to live better for longer. I will not fight you, brother! I'm not your brother. Audiences are no stranger to heart-pounding action and adventure when Chris Hemsworth is on the screen. Forgive me, Jane. And now the star of Marvel's Thor is taking on his toughest challenge yet. So you're probably asking yourself why I'm dangling off a rope a thousand feet off the ground. I'm asking the same question. Well, Disney wanted to make a show about longevity. Turns out this has something to do with it. On the new Nat Geo series, Limitless, Hemsworth pushes himself to his mental and physical limit, all in the name of longevity. <laughs> what are you thinking? Oh, nothing, I'm just trying to enjoy the view and be comfortable in a very uncomfortable situation. <laughs> How are you approached about doing Limitless? Darren Aronofsky uh, called me up and said, I want to do this doc series on longevity. I've been pretty health conscious uh, through my life and trained a lot and a pretty good sense of nutrition and so on. But in the space of longevity, I was, it was all incredibly new and um, unknown territory for me. Was there any hesitation? I don't think I knew what the show was when I was first asked <laughs> to do it. <laughs> I think if, um, I, nor do I think even the producers on the show, Darren, the thing organically grew uh, over the two years we shot it. and. Each challenge, you know, often started small and advanced throughout the experience. Initially, it was about, you know, cold water immersion and I'd be doing some ice baths. And then before I know it, we're flying into Norway and I'm swimming in the Arctic Ocean. Oh, OK, let's get it. But his wife wasn't so enthusiastic. I feel like I'm dying. OK. <laughs> you actually probably are. My wife, a couple of times, said, hang on, you're walking out on a crane that's up top of the skyscraper and, okay, you're gonna climb a rope that's a thousand feet off the ground and you're gonna swim in the Arctic. You were preparing for the role of Thor at the same time. Mm. Was there any part that the studio executives thought, you're doing what? <laughs> if it wasn't also a Disney production, I'm not sure that they would have let me do it at all. Uh, but when I ruptured my ankle, they stepped in and said, you can do this challenge after we finish shooting the movie. What was most challenging? Each episode was um, was challenging and tough in different ways. The four day fast was, water only fast was very intense, um, especially, I you know, come off shooting Thor where I was continuously eating and having as many calories as I could. Climbing the rope. What I'm proposing is you dangle at the bottom, 
climb all the way up. <laughs> Intimidated. The shock episode, swimming in Norway in, in freezing conditions, that, that, that felt like, you know, a thousand ice cream headaches <laughs> being driven into my head at once. My, my limbs felt like lead balloons. So a lot of it became the sort of mental fortitude and, and, you know, trusting the science and the people that were guiding me through these experiences and kind of just head down and go for it. So the main risk is really that the longer you spend in the water, the risk goes up exponentially. If you push yourself beyond the point at which you should be coming out, there is a real risk you could die. So the basic idea here is that there's so much new scientific research about how you can best unlock your own superpowers, right? Mm -hmm. What did you learn about that that you feel like, hmm, these, there might actually be something here? Every day was a educational experience for me. Um, and I continue to do a lot of the things I learned throughout the show. It being able to to share that on a larger platform with many people and, and have it be something that is easily accessible and to have sort of me be the guinea pig throughout it and hopefully have people go, oh, OK, cool, we're, we, we all have the same sort of challenges and stresses and also opportunities at our fingertips to be in the driver's seat and say, I want to make this change, or I, want to, I want to try this. You've said before that you've never experienced anything like this, like Limitless and what mm. you've undergone. How so? How was this so different from, you know, all the, I imagine, really grueling and intense training when you're mm -hmm. becoming Thor? The fact that I'm playing myself too, I'm not hiding behind the character, but you're very exposed when it's just you up there. I sort of welcomed the opportunity to do that, you know, because it was, it was a different experience. Was there any aspect of it that you were like, I'm a real life superhero? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time I was just sort of getting the end of it. I was like, do we get the shot? Are we rolling there? Because I'm not doing it again. <laughs> Despite his seemingly superhuman abilities, the star's toughest challenge went well below the surface. Today we're going to talk about your mortality. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So we have a little exercise prepared for you, a little bit of exposure therapy. The final episode, the acceptance episode, where um, I was forced to confront my own death and my own mortality, and that was, that was unlike anything I've ever done. Uh, I think what it gave me by the end of it was an even greater appreciation for what I have right in front of me and life and wonderful family and friends and, and what an incredible time I've had through life and and, um, and to carry that through in my days, you know, and I think it makes, uh, you know, take nothing for granted. Any of your Marvel co-stars who you'd <laughs> like to see uh, participate in mm. Limitless season two? Um, Scarlett Johansson. Okay, all right, all right, we'll get a woman in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think she'd, she'd, she'd put me to shame. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get on with it, shall we? National Geographic's Limitless, our thanks to Chris for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, 1,400 Christmas trees on the move from Nashua, New Hampshire, to perhaps a home near you, maybe your own. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, it's almost here. I can't believe we're talking about it, not even Thanksgiving just yet. All right, that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. In the next hour, the new backlash and heartbreak for Taylor Swift fans. And you won't believe the snow totals being forecast for the Buffalo area. It's extreme, even for them. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the
the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From the giant sequoias to the waterfalls, it's an amazing place. But in Yosemite, criminals go on vacation too. The park ranger found partial human remains. It was a human hand. That opened the possibility of suspects. Henry Lee Lucas. Carrie Stainer. Donald Gibson. Any of them could have done it. We're going to figure this thing out. Wild Crime, Season 2, Murder in Yosemite. Now streaming only on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us afternoons for everything you need to know. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Three Customs and Border Protection agents have been shot and wounded off Puerto Rico. Gunmen opened fire as the agents approached a suspected drug smuggling boat about 14 miles off the coast. Agents fired back with Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas saying at least one member was gravely injured. Ticketmaster is facing more trouble over the unprecedented demand for Taylor Swift Concerts tour tickets. After days of backlash over pre-sale tickets for her new tour, the company now says tomorrow's planned public on-sale event has been canceled. Ticketmaster says it simply does not have enough ticket inventory left to meet demand. The Tennessee Attorney General has launched an investigation into the company's handling of the pre-sale tickets. Police and the FBI are searching for suspects following a bank robbery on the island of Martha's Vineyard. Authorities say three armed robbers entered this bank this morning, tying up employees before escaping in a stolen truck, which was later recovered. There's no word on just how much money was taken, and ferry service to and from the island was not stopped. Next to the end of an era in Congress for a trailblazer, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, the first woman to ever hold that position, announced today that she is leaving Democratic leadership after more than two decades. The 82-year-old said the hour has come for a new generation to lead. Pelosi will remain in Congress to represent her district, as she has for 35 years now. Our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, reports in from Capitol Hill. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Today on Capitol Hill, Congress coming to a standstill to witness a historic passing of the torch. The House will be in order. Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing that come January, she will no longer lead House Democrats, something she's done for 20 years. For me, the hours come for a new generation to lead the Democratic caucus that I so deeply respect. Pelosi is a singular figure in American history. When I came to the Congress in 1987, there were 12 Democratic women. Now they're over 90, and we want more. <laughs> the first and only From female California, Speaker of the House. Nancy Pelosi. Her father, a congressman himself, politics in her blood. So help me God. The first came motherhood raising five children before she switched careers. Never would I have thought that someday I would go from homemaker to house speaker. As speaker, Pelosi worked with four presidents, often going toe to toe with Donald Trump. The power of the speaker is awesome, awesome. President Biden today calling her the most consequential speaker of the house in our history. Because of Nancy Pelosi, the lives of millions and millions of Americans are better even in districts represented by Republicans who voted against her bills and too often vilify her. Pelosi's colleagues cheering as she listed her accomplishments. Transformative health care reform with President Barack Obama. Even Newt Gingrich in the past year saying, you could argue she's been the strongest speaker in history. Pelosi's announcement comes nearly three weeks after her husband Paul was viciously attacked in their San Francisco home. For my dear husband Paul, who has been my beloved partner in life and my pillar of support. Thank you. We're all grateful for all the prayers and well wishes as he continues his recovery. Thank you so much. 
Pelosi says she will remain in Congress, just not in leadership. In January, Republicans take power, but only with a slim majority. Last week, the American people spoke and their voices were raised in defense of liberty, of the rule of law, and of democracy itself. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, so who's in position to succeed Pelosi as leader of the House Democrats? Well, Lindsay, I'll tell you that the front runner is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of New York. If elected by House Democrats, he would make history as the first black lawmaker to lead a party in Congress. But listen, Pelosi will still have major influence. She's stepping down from leadership, but she will continue to serve out her term in Congress. But she did make one thing very clear today. She believes it's time for a new generation of leaders to step in. Lindsay. Changing of the guard here for sure. Rachel Scott from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. There is growing fear in an Idaho college town tonight where four students were murdered. Police are now backing away from saying that there is no threat to the community. And investigators are asking local businesses if anyone recently bought a fixed blade Rambo style knife. ABC's Kana Whitworth is in Idaho with more. Tonight, police in Idaho pouring over the crime scene inside that off-campus home where four college students were brutally murdered. Investigators say the two surviving roommates have been very cooperative with police. Potentially, they are witnesses. Potentially, they are victims. Um, you know, we want Potentially, to they're the key Potentially to this whole the thing. Key. Exactly. Potentially, they're the key to this whole thing. Tonight, some shops are closing early. There's frustration with police and fear in the community. Did you hear anything that night? Anything... No, I'm like 50 yards away. Yeah. It was like, that's scary for me. Police walking back earlier claims that there's no threat to the public. We still believe it's a targeted attack. But the reality is there's still a person out there who committed four horrible, horrible crimes. So I think we got to go back to there is a threat out there still, possibly. Investigators piecing together a timeline with videos from that night. Two of the victims seen here at a food truck on their way home from a bar. The other two had returned from a party. Police found no signs of forced entry, but Kaylee Gonsalves' sister telling us that people were in and out of the house all the time. When I'm looking at this door, there's like a, it's like a keypad with numbers on it. Mm -hmm. But that's how they got in and out. Um, so there is that door. There's also a backsliding door. Um, and I, I will say, yes, there is that keypad lock on it. And my sister was absolutely a, a door locker. This was the party house and it's been generations. And so I won't say that uh, they were very private with that code. So many people potentially had access. Our thanks to Kena for that. Last night, we reported that Buffalo could see four feet of snow. That forecast, believe it or not, has gotten worse. The city could now see five feet of snow. And at least six states from New York to Wisconsin are now under weather alerts. Matt Rivers is in upstate New York with the latest. Tonight, drivers facing whiteout conditions. An Arctic blast fueling what the National Weather Service is calling a crippling, life-threatening storm. There will not be a time from 7 p.m. tonight until 7 p.m. tomorrow where it is safe to drive. Wrecked vehicles already lining highways north of Syracuse in Parrish, New York. Continuous snowfall rates of up to four inches an hour expected in some spots. In Buffalo, they're bracing for a potentially paralyzing accumulation. You're telling me this storm is different than other ones you've seen. Yeah, there's potential for 48 inches of snow here, and that is nowhere near a normal snow for Buffalo, New York. So. This will be unique even to the city of Buffalo. West of Buffalo, dozens of truckers hunkering down Wednesday night, packing this rest area off Interstate 90 to ride out the storm there. New York's governor closing more than 130 miles of the thruway from Rochester to the Pennsylvania border to commercial traffic, including big rigs, starting this afternoon. When they jackknife, as we saw in previous storms, they literally can paralyze our highways, putting people at risk, stranding motorists, for hours, if not days. That's what happened almost exactly eight years ago. In November of 2014, a lake effect system dumped more than five feet of snow on western New York. At least 13 people died. Tonight, they are bracing for yet another potentially historic storm, one that will test this region that knows about powerful storms. They're being put to the test for sure, thanks to Matt.
Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins us now. And Ginger, it appears that old man winter is early with the coldest air of the season already for many of us. And forecasted totals from this lake effect snowstorm just massive. We're talking about as many as five feet yes. of snow. It's really astounding to see numbers like this, and we don't get this every single season with Lake Effect. While they can be very prolific, uh, think 22 years ago when Buffalo itself had 24.9 inches of snow in just 24 hours. That's their record 24-hour snowfall. That often comes in a days-long event, and that's what this type of storm is going to do, or this type of event. So let's dive into the maps and see that Ironwood, Michigan, and the Upper Peninsula, parts of Wisconsin, down to my hometown of Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo, up into Traverse City area. Then those Lake affects snow warnings for Ohio, Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, Buffalo, of course, over to Watertown. So here's what happens. The totals end up looking like this. More than a foot along 131, say. That's really messy in West Michigan. Then you go over to just south of Buffalo, and that's where the heftiest totals bullseye. Watertown, two to four feet around there. Nothing to sneeze at. But how does this happen? It's when you get three to four inch per hour snowfall rates. Thunder snow will not be out of the question. You're going to have super convection, like a thunderstorm type that would drop that much precipitation. And that's why we have these extreme impacts anticipated surrounding those two cities along Interstate 90 and I-81. Don't forget that power outages could be a problem. And of course, you could end up with extremely dangerous travel. I always try to emphasize it's not just the snow on the road, but the visibility can be totally fine and then go to absolute zero because these bands are so narrow. The wind chill across the nation don't give in for really anybody except for extreme South Florida from Louisiana over to Georgia we have freeze alerts and so I think this time of year Lindsay it is really hard for me to imagine that one week ago today right. I was standing in a rare late season land falling hurricane and here we go with what could be a record maker and I've had a little experience with thunder snow it is as dangerous as it is scary so uh, I'm sure yes. that people are going to be staying off the roads if possible ginger our thanks to you now to Ukraine, where millions are without power as Russia continues to unleash new missile attacks. And there was another headline today, one that shows just how ruthless Russia has been for years. ABC's James Longman is in Ukraine. Tonight, eight years after a Malaysian jetliner was shot down over Ukraine, three men were today convicted for the murders of the 298 people on board. Verdachte Girkin, Dubinsky and Chachenko were verurteilt. A Dutch court sentenced two Russians and a pro-Kremlin Ukrainian to life sentences for their role in the downing of flight MH17, which was hit by a Russian missile while it was flying over rebel-held territory shortly after Putin invaded Crimea in 2014. The men were convicted in absentia and are still protected by Moscow, so will likely never serve their sentence. Nearly a decade after that horror, Russia continues to act with impunity launching a new wave of missile attacks today. This strike caught on camera in the eastern Ukrainian city of Dnipro. Nearly every single window blown out, but people yet again already trying to piece their lives back together. You can see some of the damage uh, up here as well. Ukrainian air defense is active across the country, trying to shoot down those Russian missiles. The US and NATO believe one of those Ukrainian missiles crashed inside Poland this week, killing two people. President Zelensky insists it was not one of Ukraine's. Their officials were today granted access to the site to join the investigation. <laughs> Moscow aiming to cripple the power grid and make life unlivable for civilians as winter sets in while they retreat on the battlefield. In newly liberated Kherson, the airfield is littered with destroyed Russian vehicles. This is a great visualization of the sheer scale of Russian losses here. The Russians left Kherson because Ukraine forced them to. Local commander Konstantin shows us round. Let's step back. This is a Russian bunker. What he's doing there is making sure there are no mines. Russians leave mines absolutely everywhere. He's prodding the earth, very shallow, to make sure there's no device. But then Konstantin raises a finger after hearing the distant thud of Russian artillery. Come on. We took cover protectively. Go on. We've got to get out, I think. Civilians across this country have almost no warning when Russia strikes. Such prolonged fear there. James Longman joins us now from Dnipro in eastern Ukraine. James, U.S. Secretary Blinken says the U.S. and NATO are sharing the latest information on the missile incident in Poland with Ukrainian officials. What do we know? 
Well, the US is walking a bit of a tightrope on this one because it says that this was a Ukrainian air defence missile. Now, Poland and all NATO partners say the same thing, and yet Ukraine is committed to this idea that it came from Russia. So, Secretary Blinken, with a bit of diplomacy today, saying they were sharing absolutely everything with the Ukrainians, constantly keeping them updated every single day, and inviting them to come and be involved in the investigation. But he underlined one crucial point, which was that if Russia hadn't fired all those missiles into Ukraine, then there wouldn't have been an explosion in Poland. He said that Russia bears ultimate responsibility. Lindsay. James Longman, our thanks to you. Joining us now for more on the war in Ukraine and the fight to save our planet from the effects of climate change as COP27 comes to a close is the president of the UN General Assembly, Chaba Karoshi. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, we'll get to the UN Climate Conference in just a moment, but first I'd like to start with Russia's war in Ukraine. We saw two civilian deaths this week after a missile landed in Poland. It appears this was an accident, but it really also is an example of how an accident could potentially draw NATO into a war, it seems. Good afternoon, Lindsay. Thank you much for having me on your show. Uh, indeed, uh, it was a very dangerous situation, and we are still waiting for the concrete and clear picture of what really has happened. I'd like to commend uh, the behavior of the Polish government to remain cool-headed. Uh, but it also gives an indication how dangerous it could be when a large-scale war is fought in Europe. Uh, the consequences might, from one second to another, become very, very dangerous. This war should be stopped. This war should not have started. And this should, war should be ended as soon as possible. I think that so many would, of course, agree with you. But here we have a targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure. That's prohibited under international humanitarian law, but that's exactly what Russia has been doing for months now in Ukraine. How can the world now really hold them accountable? Uh, indeed, a couple of days ago, the General Assembly has adopted a very, very important decision, resolution, which is suggesting to put together uh, a kind of claim registry, uh, which is indicating who is responsible and what kind of dam for what kind of damages. Uh, I think it's a historic precedent. Uh, it deserves a good attention. There will be still many, many debates about how to set it up, but it indicates that the world does not accept of targeting civilian infrastructure, civilian population, and there should be consequences. And let's pivot now to the UN Climate Summit. It's been nearly two weeks at this point, and there's been a lot of contentious debate. Countries are fighting. There are even questions about if some goals in the Paris Climate Agreement should be dismissed at this point. Is talk enough, or, or as your colleague Antonio Gutierrez put it bluntly, are we really on a highway to hell with our foot on the accelerator? Uh, I understand uh, the approach of the Secretary General, and he would like to shake up the world. And I think I can join hand with him. But uh, let me a little bit optimistic now for, for the sake of our view viewers. Uh, there were some already some good results at this COP. Uh, it was the first COP in the history of climate summits where water was introduced as an element, uh, as, a, as, uh, as a project that should be factored in into the climate policies. But you are absolutely right. There are some open issues and there are still a lot to be done, including of how our ambitions and real deeds of uh, uh, cutting uh, Greece, greenhouse gas emissions could be put in accordance with the goals adopted in the, in the Paris Agreement. There are also huge debates of how to meet the financial commitments made by countries, mostly by developed countries. Uh, so there will be a huge issue. How are we going to share this, uh, uh, this burden? And the devastating flooding in Pakistan and the historic famine in East Africa, both are, are examples of, of what our future just might look like around the world. Are developed countries, in your estimation, providing enough support for those who are bearing the brunt of the effects of climate change? Uh, the developing countries uh, have a very strong point that they contributed uh, to the Anthropocene, the human-induced climate change, to a very, very little uh, percentage. Though being rather vulnerable, uh, they are suffering uh, 
increasingly large proportion of the of the damage. So they have they have asked uh, the developed countries to contribute 100 billion dollars uh, annually to compensate uh, to their efforts to support their efforts. Uh, this. Agreement was done actually almost 10 years ago. It has been reconfirmed in 2016, 2015, 2016 in Paris. But when we come to the loss and damage, uh, loss and damage discussions, the amount of money that might be involved, it is more than 100 times more than 100 mm. billion dollars. So you are absolutely right. The old commitments have never been fully honored. And we are now started discussing uh, a, another commitment which go way beyond any uh, formal past commitments. You mentioned just a little while ago that you feel that we are making progress. Of course, we have many of the brightest minds focused in on finding solutions. We're definitely in need of some innovative ideas. I am curious, in particular, what gives you hope at this point that humanity will be able to pull itself out of this climate crisis? Um, my highest hope goes uh, to the integration of water and climate policies. If we can create a global water information system, it will give a, an on-time uh, precise, uh, more or less precise answer for the question of how much water can we count on globally, originally, or in a certain part of a country. Because the honest answer for this question, for the timing, we don't know. But the science can already give us very good indications how to build our economies, how to build our, our policies, how to build our are certain industries or projects. Well, it gives me hope to know that you are hopeful. Mr. Chaba Karoshi, President of the UN General Assembly, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Lindsay. And still to come, the major sentences handed down for protests in Iran as anti-government protests continue in the country. And the history of hip-hop bling. The author of the book Ice Cold explains how the relationship between rappers and their jewelry reaches beyond the music. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. There are new images of violent crackdowns by Iranian police on protests, which are now entering their third month. Videos posted on social media show a crowd inside a packed subway station fleeing security forces as they open fire with metal pellets. The protests erupted in September after the death of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old woman who was detained by the morality police for allegedly breaking the country's strict hijab rules. Since then, at least 348 protesters have been killed. A fire in the northern Gaza Strip has killed at least 21 people in one of the deadliest incidents in years outside of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The fire erupted on the top floor of a refugee camp, according to Hamas, which attributed the fire's cause to gasoline that was being stored in the building. It's not clear how the gas was ignited. An investigation is now underway. Russian dissident Alexei Navalny said Thursday he was being transferred from solitary confinement to a one-man cell that would continue to limit his contact with the outside world. In a 14-tweet thread, Navalny called his new confinement a regular cramped cell, but added you can have not one, but two books and use the prison kiosk. Long visits, however, are not allowed. The prominent Putin foe is serving a nine-year sentence at a maximum security prison east of Moscow for what he calls politically motivated charges. Whether it's diamond-encrusted grills, oversized chains, a bust-down Rolex, or a Tiffany necklace, perhaps jewelry has always been a cornerstone of hip-hop culture, featured in countless songs like Cash Money's Bling Bling. Every time I come around your city, bang, bang. Think rain, about anything, bang, bang. Every time I buy a new guy, bang, bang. The rent on your car, I'm a bad thing. And now in her new book, Ice Cold, A Hip-Hop Jewelry History, author Vicki Toback traces the history of hip-hop jewelry from Run DMC's legendary medallions in the 1980s through the over-the-top grills worn by Megan Thee Stallion today, packed with really fascinating photos. The nearly 400-page book has a forward by hip-hop superstar Slick Rick and essays by big names like ASAP Ferg, L. Cool J, just to name a few. And joining us now is Ice Cold author Vicki Toback herself. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It, this is just really phenomenal pictures that you've captured here. What made you decide, you know, I'm going to actually dedicate an entire book, a photo essay, essentially, about jewelry worn in hip-hop culture? I mean, it was time for this history to be told. You know, um, I grew up an immigrant kid in Detroit, fell in love with the music, and then became a journalist. Um, I always knew that jewelry culture was a big part of hip hop culture from the very start, you know, from the 1980s all the way on to recent times. Um, and so just really wanted to celebrate what that meant. Um, and we decided to do it in, you know, in book form because it really is a historic moment. And and what did you find? Because, I mean, when you look at, in particular, LL Cool J or Run DMC, they always had the big, thick chains or or Tretch from Naughty by Nature who always had, you know, like a lock, lock. on his on his necklace. I, I see a quote in here in particular from LL Cool J who says, by 18, jewelry became part of my own DNA. What is uh, the trend that you found really so deeply embedded in the culture? What we adorn ourselves with um, what we put on our bodies, right? That's something that goes back to the days of kings and queens and um, showing status, showing wealth, what we communicate our identities. And you take that and you apply that to hip hop and it takes on a whole different meaning that sort of grew from big gold chains, you know, the hoop earrings for women. Um, and then platinum and diamonds started being used. And it was a way to communicate who you were. It was a way to show your identity. And it was a way to really show, you know, brotherhood and nationhood even with like label chains. Um, so there's a lot of meaning behind the pieces um, and a, a lot of history. And, and you mentioned in book, the book too that many of the jewelers themselves were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Let's talk a, a little bit about the, the, the influence of, of the, the jewelers on the hip hop culture and, and what was worn there. Traditionally, when especially when hip hop was really young. Um, a lot of the big, you know, fashion brands, both in jewelry and in clothing, weren't really like servicing the hip hop community. So alongside that, you had certain jewelers that were catering to hip hop. Um, an early jeweler named Tito Caicedo, you hear his name in, you know, Jay-Z and Biggie lyrics. Then came Jacob the jeweler, then came, you know, Aviani and Cone. Of course, nowadays we have, you know, Greg Una or Ben Baller or a whole host of, of jewelers. And 
pretty much all of them are either immigrants or children of immigrants. And I think that they in hip hop recognized a certain hustle in each other, certain questioning of, you know, where do we fit into the American dream? Do you have any idea of like estimates on, on how much some of these cost? Pharrell actually just auctioned recently a few of his pieces. Um, and his, it's called the Bait Chain, which was designed by Jacob and Co. That went for a million five, and that was, you know, multicolored diamonds um, and a big design. And and you know, back in the day when it was just gold, it wasn't as expensive as it is now. But once people started, you know, adding diamonds to the mix, and now all kinds of gemstones like sky's the limit for I mean you easily easily 500,000 a million um and up and that's just for like the diamond stud right right <laughs> what would you like for viewers or for readers to, to actually take away from the book I'd like for readers to take away that this is not just conspicuous consumption or ostentation I want them to think about it with within what hip hop culture has done and how far it's come. You know, next year, 2023 is 50 year, like mm. the 50th anniversary of hip hop. You know, I would just want people to look deeper into what the jewelry communicates and the role it played in, in the music and the culture. And and lastly, it, this is such a real trip down memory lane. I forgot that people used to wear like the brass knuckles and all of that. Any particular favorite jewelry that, that you have included? Biggie's Jesus piece mm. is a favorite of mine um, simply because, you know, it's such an iconic piece. Um, and it's something that people have like remixed and customized for, you know, now time immemorial since Biggie passed. That's my favorite. But also also, I want to point to my current favorite jewelry person, which is Tyler, the creator. He has um, sort of taken what, you know, Pharrell did with the multicolored stones and the fun, you know, cartoon characters and stuff and just like elevated it. Vicki Toback, we thank you so much. We want to let our viewers know that Ice Cold, a hip hop jewelry history is now available to purchase wherever books are sold. And still to come, a Grammy-winning singer makes a woman's dream come true. The superstar who centered the delivery of a lifetime. Kanye West is complicated. I think one of the things that we want to do is have an uncomfortable conversation. When you hear the name Ye or Kanye West, how do you guys react? I've only been Jewish for going on maybe 10 years. The amount of anti-Semitism I've experienced has been beyond. This is Impact by Nightline. Is Ye an anti-Semite? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary news-making year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. She's a Grammy-winning singer, and the truth about her doesn't hurt. Superstar Lizzo helped to make the dreams of a super fan come true by sending her one of her own dresses for a special event. Our Stephanie Ramos talked to the lucky fan about this amazing gift. Okay, stop, stop, stop. This TikTok is for Lizzo. 
This might be the best example of ask and you shall receive. Ariel Marie, a queer writer and poet from Atlanta, is receiving the biggest accolade of their career, being named to the prestigious Out 100, a list of impactful and influential LGBTQ people. And there's nothing that I want more than to be able to be in New York in a month and accept the award. It's just one little problem. We can't find anything to wear. But a brilliant plan came to mind. I gotta ask. Can I please, 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 please wear your dress from the 2022 Emmys, please? It's my favorite. Fast forward to three weeks later. Ah! Shut up! Shut up! We met with the Gumbo Yaya author in the Big Apple while they were getting glammed up for their gala. to feel like Lizzo. I felt so excited to see it and then it felt real. And what a dress it is. After adding some jewelry and one last and photo shoot, Ooh! Ariel stunned us with the dress Lizzo sent, the one she wore during the 2019 American Music Awards where she performed her Grammy winning song, Jerome. You look amazing. Thank you. Did you ever think that Lizzo would actually send you this dress? No. I mean, I'm a stranger. Uh, Lizzo, has n Lizzo had no idea who I was. Ariel sharing that even now, finding gorgeous gowns for plus size women can be difficult and stressful. When someone is in a body that's larger, right, than how we think they should look, we value them less. And that's true from fashion and pop culture. You made it here. Lizzo made it happen. She yeah. gave you something to feel fabulous. What would be your message to Lizzo? Um, I keep telling myself, Ariel, don't be silly. It's just a dress. I'm really grateful because I think that everyone deserves to feel this beautiful. Ariel says, like the Lizzo song used in their TikTok video, they deserve this. Love that for Ariel. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.